church anniversary online worship experience. 107 years God has allowed Mount Moriah Baptist Church to hold up the bloodstained banner for the Lord. And so we're excited to celebrate 107 years of ministry. Isn't it interesting that in these unprecedented times that God has fixed it, that the church, the local church, that traditionally, historically, gathers together under the same roof to corporately worship God and give God praise. And then as we shelter in place, isn't it good to know that we can still give God worship and praise corporately together uh, through the internet, through technology? And so we give God praise that even now, though we can't shelter together in this place, to celebrate 107 years. We're thankful that God has allowed us to do so through technology. So I pray that right where you are, wherever you are, that you would join with us as we worship God and celebrate God and thank God for 107 years of ministry, meaningful ministry here at the Mount. God has brought us a mighty long way as my grandfather would say, he's brought us over high mountains and through dark valleys. And we made it this far by faith. And so let's give God praise as we celebrate 107 years of ministry to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you for the blessings of life and the blessings of this day. We thank you for 107 years of ministry here at the Mount. We thank you that you established this church and you promised in your word that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we thank you today and we praise you that even though hell has tried to stop and stagnate the ministry here at the Mount, uh, that evil and Satan has not had the victory, but we have the victory through Christ Jesus, and we give you praise, glory, and honor. Um, we ask that you would bless our worship experience, bless our time together. Let it be fruitful, let it glorify you, edify the saints, horrify Satan, and justify sinners. Oh God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Amen and amen again. God bless you. Come on, can you put your hands together in this worship city and come on and give God glory? He's good and his mercy endures forever.
Most people want to be respected in all areas of their life. We want to be respected in our homes. We want to be uh, known for being uh, good employees, good parents, good spouses, uh, good neighbors, good friends, good frats, good sorrows, good church members. And the list goes on and on. Most people want to be good for something. And I would submit to you that rarely do people want to be good for nothing. But my brothers and sisters, everybody ought to want to be good for something. And the good news is the fact that we exist, the fact that God created us is proof that we are good for something. God created all of us with a plan and a purpose in mind. And if you believe that, then I believe that you want to hear the Lord say someday, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many. My brothers and sisters, if you want to hear the Lord say, well done, then you've got to first well do. And all of us should want to well do. All of us should want to be considered a good disciple by the Lord. We should all want to be honorable vessels. And if I can be honest with you, my brothers and sisters, there have been times in my own life uh, when I wondered how I could be a vessel of honor to God. Uh, my brothers and sisters, when I think about how fractured, flawed, and frail that I am, uh, I've wondered how uh, I could be used by God to be a vessel of honor. I mess up more than I get it right sometimes. Uh, when I try to do right, I end up doing wrong. And then there are those times when I do right and I feel wrong. Uh, you have the best intentions and somewhere between what and huh, your best intentions are replaced by uh, what you didn't intend to happen. You find yourself saying things like, oh, I didn't mean to cuss them out, but they kept on uh, pushing me. I was trying to be nice, but they just wouldn't leave it alone. Or maybe, like me, you've given aid and assistance to someone, but you did it with the wrong attitude. You didn't do it cheerfully. And my brothers and sisters, you might have done the right thing, uh, but you felt wrong. And so you may wonder, how can I possibly be a vessel of honor? Well, I think I ought to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that when I have those thoughts and those feelings, I'm reminded of King David. If King David could be a vessel of honor, then you and I can be a vessel of honor. My brothers and sisters, because you do know that David was considered a vessel of honor. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. But my brothers and sisters, I can also recall that David... Uh, had his failures and fumbles because David, my brothers and sisters, he wore a halo, but sometimes he wore a horn because he took a man's wife and then he took that man's life and yet God still used David mightily to his glory and honor. Then I think about Moses. Moses who grew up in Pharaoh's house. Moses, that mighty man of valor. But Moses... My brothers and sisters, Moses was frail and flawed as well. In a moment of anger, Moses slew uh, a fellow human being and then ran to hide from his crime. Yet, God saw fit after years of softening Moses' heart in the Midianite desert to call him forth and use him as a powerful deliverer to his people, Israel. Then I think about Abraham. He was called a friend of God because of his faith in God. God told Abraham to leave his family, his kindred, his homeland, and go to a land that God would show him. And Abraham obeyed to a point. Abraham left his father, his family, uh, his kindred, and his homeland, uh, but he took his nephew Lot with him and a host of other folk. So Abraham didn't fully obey God. And that's not the only fumble that Abraham had. But all I'm trying to tell you is that.
that God didn't let the fumble and the frailty and the fragileness of his servants stop him from using them to his glory and honor. And my brothers and sisters, the panoply of scripture is full of flawed people who were used as vessels of honor. As a matter of fact, the writer of this epistle, the Apostle Paul, was flawed, furious, and felonious because he was persecuting the church that God had created. And yet God used him as a vessel of honor to bring the same gospel that he tried to destroy to the rest of the world. Are y'all going to help me preach the man? All I'm trying to tell you is that God uses flawed and fragile people as vessels of honor. And my brothers and sisters, Paul, in this second letter to Timothy, is writing to educate, encourage, and edify uh, the young preacher to prepare him for the challenges of ministry. And my brothers and sisters, Paul wasn't going to be with Timothy much longer. And so... He knew that the time of his departure was at hand and uh, Paul was in prison facing execution on Nero's chopping block. When he wrote this letter, Paul had been abandoned by friends and associates who were seemingly uh, ashamed of Paul uh, because of his constant troubles, his constant uh, trials and tribulations. He's always in jail and they felt like that these were signs that Paul's uh, apostleship might be in question. They felt like because Paul seemed to always be in some mess, always seemed to be up in his neck in trouble, they felt like maybe Paul wasn't really called to be an apostle. Maybe Paul was all talk and no show, and they have walked away from Paul, but here Paul is in prison writing to encourage Timothy when Paul himself needs encouragement. And my brothers and sisters, have you ever been there when you needed encouragement uh, yourself? You were going through hell and high water and you found yourself encouraging somebody else. That's how it ought to be for every child of God. Paul was in trouble. He was in jail. He was facing uh, a death, but he was still encouraged and trying to be an encouragement to somebody else. And I don't care what you're going through right now, you ought to be able to still be an encouragement to somebody else because as long as you know that the Lord is on your side, you can make it and have the victory in whatever it is that God has given you to do. Paul is writing to his protege in the ministry, Timothy, who was about to embark on full-time ministry. And Paul is writing to inspire and instruct the young preacher. First and second Timothy, along with the book of Titus, are known as the pastoral epistles. And my brothers and sisters, uh, they are known as the pastoral epistles or letter because Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus, two preachers, two pastors, to prepare them for ministry. And I think I ought to tell you that even though the context of the letter is dealing with a pastoral ministry, it can also apply to you too. So before you try to tune me out talking about uh, this is about preachers and pastors, and since I'm not a preacher or a pastor, this doesn't apply to me. Oh, yes it does, because what's good for the pastor is good for the people. Because the pastor is a person first. And so if it's good for the pulpit, it's also good for the pews. And so my brothers and sisters, in this second chapter of this second letter, Paul starts off by encouraging Timothy in the first 13 verses to not quit on Paul or quit on God, to stick with the ministry. Don't leave, don't quit, don't give up as some have already done, but endure hardship as a good soldier. Then in verses 14 through 19, Paul begins to deal with uh, good and bad workmen. Study to show thyself approved a workman who need not be ashamed, but who rightly divides the word of truth. Because there were some folk, there were some false teachers who had sprung up who were wrongly dividing the word of truth. And so here Paul was preparing Timothy, Timothy to deal with these false teachers. And so Paul had been dealing with false teachers throughout his ministry. 
And now he wants to equip Timothy and, and, and Titus to deal with them too. And my brothers and sisters, he, he spends the remainder of chapter 2 talking about uh, contrasting honorable vessels with dishonorable vessels. And that's where I want to pick up in this pericope at verses 20 and 21. Paul says that in a large house, uh, there are vessels or utensils, gold and silver, wood and clay. Some for honor and some for dishonor. And my brothers and sisters, Paul's readers uh, knew and all of us know what it is to have uh, special dishes and common dishes. Uh, I was going to get some, something to drink the other day at the house and I opened up the cabinet and I didn't grab the nice uh, glasses. I didn't grab uh, the fine china, uh, but I grabbed one of Summer's uh, old cups when she was a little guy. We still got it. It's in the cabinet. It's got SpongeBob on it because uh, I, I, that's a common everyday utensil. But my brothers and sisters, Paul wasn't necessarily speaking of those kinds of utensils when he talked about honorable and dishonorable. My brothers and sisters, Paul was talking about uh, the kind of vessel, the kind uh, that you only think of using for the particular reason that you use it for. Uh, let me see if I can make it clearer. Uh, you wouldn't take the rag that you wipe the kitchen floor or the bathroom floor you wouldn't take that same rag and wash your face or wash the kitchen table or wipe off uh, the kitchen counters. You, you, you wouldn't take the same spatula that you use to flip your pancakes or uh, flip your hamburgers. Uh, the, the same spatula that you use to cook with, you wouldn't then take that same spatula and then you use it when you walk your dog to scoop dog poop. My brothers and sisters, so Paul is saying to Timothy, that vessels of dishonor can only be used for dishonorable things. And Paul didn't want Timothy to fall in line with the false teachers and become a dishonorable vessel. Because the dishonorable vessels, the false teachers are dishonorable because they teach lies. That's what makes them dishonorable vessels. They participate in activities and conversations that the pastor and other people should participate in. And Paul wanted Timothy to understand that he's a gift and he can't use his gift in dishonorable ways. You can't take that which bears the image of God, the imagio Dei. You can't take that which bears his image and use it for dishonorable purposes. You and I need to understand that we were created in the image of God. And since we were created in the image of God, God didn't make no junk. And so we can't be acting like junk and hanging around junk if we are going to be vessels of honor. These false teachers were, uh, they, they were vessels of dishonor. Paul instructs Timothy in verse 21 that if anyone is going to be a vessel of honor, that he must cleanse himself from the vessels of dishonor. That he must separate himself from false teachers with their false doctrines, false attitudes, false actions. Paul said that Timothy must cleanse himself because the vessels that God uses must be clean. And if you wouldn't use toilet water to cook your food with, then why would you think God would use folk who are full of Stuff to do his will. That's why Paul said in Romans 6.13, no longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as someone who's been brought from death unto life. And then present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. When we do this, Paul says that we'll be vessels of honor. In verse 21, he said, therefore, if any man cleanses himself, 
If anyone cleanses himself from the lap, he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So the first thing that we learn about vessels of honors is that they are elect. Let the church say elect. Paul said that vessels of honor are sanctified. That word in the Greek is hagios, and it means set apart, it means holy, and, and, and it's, my brothers and sisters, uh, those of us who have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are known as the elect because we have been selected and set apart by God for special service in his kingdom. And my brothers and sisters, because we have been elected by God, I think I ought to tell you, it matters how we live. False teachers would tell you that you can live any old kind of way and call yourself a child of God. They'll tell you, my brothers and sisters, uh, that God doesn't care what you do as long as you uh, are in Christ Jesus. But my brothers and sisters, that's false. Because Paul taught in Romans chapter 6, he says, what shall we say then? Uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Then he answers this question, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in and in longer? Or do you not know? That as many as us, as us were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Uh, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we should also walk in a newness of life. My brothers and sisters, it's important how we live. Now, I told you we are saved, we are elect, we've been selected and set apart, sanctified, made holy by God. And my brothers and sisters, I think I ought to tell you that we were saved uh, not by good works, our good works, but we were saved unto good works. So it matters how we treat people. It matters how uh, we do our job. It matters my attitude toward God and the things of God. My life belongs to God, so it matters how I live. I am elect, and false teaching is not going to convince me that because God has selected and has set me apart, that I can now live and do what I want to do, that whatever feels good, I'm going to do it. Whatever I think I want to do, I'm going. that's not what the elect are supposed to do. Yes, God has chosen us, but we got to choose God. What do you mean, preacher? Well, didn't Jesus say that I've chosen 12 of you? Talking about his disciples. And he said, and one of you is a devil. See, Judas was selected and set apart. Judas was chosen to be a disciple. But Judas chose to be a devil. My brothers and sisters, false teaching, I have you thinking that you can be a disciple and a devil at the same time. But if we are chosen by God to be a disciple, then we must choose whether we want to be a disciple or a devil. And you say, I ain't no devilish. I might be, I ain't no devil. I might be devilish, but I ain't no devil. Well, I think I ought to tell you that if you are devilish, then you are like the devil. Uh, you are of, like, or befitting evil, diabolical, and fiendish. I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't want to be devilish. I want to be godly. I want to be of, like, or befitting righteousness. And I'm glad that God has elected me and I have elected God. And I just need to know, is there anybody out there who can testify that you have elected God and you're thankful that God has elected you? My brothers and sisters, I say like Joshua, uh, if it seems evil, unto you to serve the Lord. 
You choose this day whom you're going to serve, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Is there anybody who can testify that that's your testimony, that you are going to serve the Lord? You don't care what everybody else is doing, who everybody else is serving, but you are going to serve the Lord because you can testify that God has been too good to you, that you understand that God is real, that God is the creator and sustainer of all life, and that God has created you with a plan and a purpose, so you will serve the Lord. But false teaching would have you thinking. That you can serve two masters. But Jesus said that we can't do that. Because he said we'll love one and we'll hate the other. And my brothers and sisters, not only are vessels of honor elect, selected, sanctified, set apart by God, but Paul also says that vessels of honor are also effective. Let the church say effective. Paul tells Timothy that if he cleanses himself, that he'll not only be elected for service, but he'll also be effective in service uh, because he would be used by God. Now, Timothy needed to cleanse himself from false teachers and false teachings because false teachings render us ineffective. Vessels of honor are not ineffective. Vessels of honor make a godly difference in the world and in the lives of others. Not only for time, but for eternity. And my brothers and sisters, if we let God use us as a vessel of honor, we'll add value to the lives of others. A folk will thank God for the blessing uh, that we are in their lives. And my brothers and sisters, when you're a vessel of honor, your mission statement ought to be to let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. If that's how you live, guess what? You are effective. Uh, when you are effective, you deal in facts, not fiction. When you are effective, you stick with the truth. And that's why Paul uh, didn't want Timothy dealing with false teachers and false teachings. Because he didn't want Timothy to be ineffective. And so he, 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 Timothy needs, his, needs to cleanse himself. He needs to stick with the truth and he'll be effective. My brothers and sisters, if our president would have stuck with the truth, during his presidency, half the folk who worked for him or associated with him wouldn't be in jail. And the other half wouldn't be on their way to jail. Uh, he wouldn't have been impeached. And we wouldn't be in the mess we're in economically. We wouldn't be a further divided nation. And we wouldn't be in the shape we're in with this pandemic. But because the president deals in falsehood and fiction, half of his employees and associates are in jail. And the other half are on their way to jail. Uh, he has been impeached. We are in an economic mess because the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. We are divided more now than we have been in a long time. And we are leading the world in the most cases of the coronavirus because we have a president who deals in fiction and falsehood. But my brothers and sisters, honorable vessels in the hand of God Almighty are effective because we understand that God is truth. And since God is truth, we must be truth if we, uh, we must operate in truth if we are going to represent God. Now, my brothers and sisters, I think I ought to remind you that there's a difference between being efficient and effective. Being efficient is doing things right. But being effective is doing the right thing. Yeah, it may be expedient to reopen the state, but it's not effective. Brian Kemp. Because it puts the citizens 
of Georgia at greater risk, especially the African American community, which has been infected and impacted by this disease more than any other population. And so that's why we are still social distancing as a church. But my brothers and sisters, honorable vessels will be affected because we not only want to do uh, things right, but we want to do the right thing, and we want to do the right thing right. And my brothers and sisters, that's why Jesus' death on the cross was effective or efficacious. Because Jesus did the right thing. Jesus did God's will uh, by living a sinless life and surrendering his life uh, to the death on a cross. He was resurrected and now sits at the right hand of the Father to intercede on our behalf. His death and resurrection is what makes salvation possible for everyone because his death satisfied God's wrath against sin. Uh, he did the right thing, my brothers and sisters, and he was effective. That's why the hymn writer said that there's a fountain filled with blood and it's drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners who plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain. My brothers and sisters, uh, his death was effective because the blood will never lose its power. That's why Andre Crouch wrote that the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, that same blood, it gives me strength from day to day because it will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain and it flows through the lowest valley. Now, my brothers and sisters, since Jesus is effective and we are in Christ Jesus, then we too must be effective. What do uh, we, we, we do that by making sure that we surrender to God daily to be used by him. And my brothers and sisters, if we do that, we will be effective. And I encourage you with the words of Paul to the Galatians when he said, don't grow weary in well-doing, for you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. You, you, you will reap a harvest if you keep on keeping on. My brothers and sisters, so I want to encourage you today uh, to keep on loving your enemies and keep on blessing those who curse you. Keep on giving up your right for someone else's wrong. Yeah, you might have a right to pay them back for what they did. Oh, but because you're a child of God, we don't repay evil for evil. So keep on being kind when folk are unkind to you. Keep on treating people right even when they treat you wrong. Keep on keeping on with God and you will be effective. But my brothers and sisters, not only are honorable vessels elect and not only are honorable vessels effective, but thoroughly and finally, uh, honorable vessels are equipped. Paul tells Timothy that if he cleanses himself, that he will not only be elected for service, that he'll not only be effective in service, but he's also equipped for service because he'd be prepared for every good work. My brothers and sisters, when God calls us, he equips us that we might be ready for every good work. You'll be ready for whatever work God assigns you as a matter
but God equipped us, my brothers and sisters, and we were able to make it through. That's what he's done for 107 years right here at this church. That's what he's done for 49 years of my life. And that's what he's done all the days of your life. My brothers and sisters, when you are equipped for every good work, it may not be in your job description, but you can handle it. You might not be a Sunday school teacher, but you could because you are equipped for every good work. Is there anybody who can testify that you are equipped? You're ready for every good work. No matter what God, what task God assigns you to, when you are elected by God, you will be effective and you will be equipped for every good work. My brothers and sisters, it may not be in your job description. Work with young people or children, but because God has equipped you, you can work with the young folk if you need to. If God needs you to be a doorkeeper in His house, you can because you are equipped for every good. As a matter of fact, you might feel ill equipped, but I'm glad to tell you that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, and with all of your flaws, all of your fractures, you may not feel like you can, you may not feel so effective, you may not feel like you are equipped, my brothers and sisters, but I want to encourage you by telling you this little old story, that's the story of an elderly Chinese woman, and she had two large pots that were attached to each end of a stick, and she carried it on her shoulder that she would take those two pots down to the watering hole and fill them up with water. One of the pots had a crack in it while the other pot was perfect with no flaws. My brothers and sisters at the end of the long watering hole back to the house. The crack pot arrived only half full for two full years. This went on daily with the woman bringing home only one and a half pots of water. Of course, the perfect pot was proud of its accomplishment. But the poor crack pot was ashamed of his own imperfection. And the miserable crack pot felt like that it could only do half of what it had been made to do. After the two years of what it perceived to be a bit of failure, it spoke to the woman one day by the stream. He said, I am ashamed of myself because I have this crack in my side that causes water to leak out all the way back to the house. The old woman smiled and said, be 
to notice that there are flowers on your side of the path, but not on the other side where the perfect pot is. That's because I've always known about your flaw. I've always known about your fracture. I've always known about your friends. And so I planted flower seeds on your side of the path. And every day while we walk back, you water those seeds along the path. And for two years, I've been able to pick those beautiful flowers to decorate the table, to decorate the house. Without my brother and sister, without you being just the way you are, there wouldn't be any beauty to grace this house. My brother and sisters, I want to leave you with that. That God knows all about your flaws and your fractures. And even with them, he's equipped you and I for every good word. We can be vessels of honor because my brothers and sisters, we have been elected, we are effective, and we have been equipped, my brothers and sisters. But that crack fly, that crack water pipe is not the only, my brothers and sisters, thing that had a, a hole in his side. They tell me that when they hung Jesus on an old rugged cross, and he died, for your sins and mine, they pierced him in his side. And out came water and blood. Is there anybody who can celebrate the fact that God can use you as a vessel of honor? I don't know what your story is. I don't care where you are right now. If you would cleanse yourself from the dishonorable things of life, my brothers and sisters, God will, He will, He let you, He will, He fetch you, and He will. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you. Thank you. I give God praise right where you are. Give God praise for 107 years of ministry. Give God praise. Tell him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for keeping me, thank you for keeping my family, thank you for keeping this world, thank you for your love, thank you for your grace, thank you for your mercy, give God praise, say yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we give God praise? Sisters and brothers, this is an opportunity for you to choose to be a vessel of honor. God, that's his desire that you would be a vessel of of honor. He loved you so much that he created you. And that when we messed up, he gave his son 
to pay the price that we should have paid because he wants to use us he wants us to be vessels of honor in his house and if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior we want to give you an opportunity to do that because that's what all of this is for and so right where you are if you want to be a vessel of honor used in the mighty hand of God Will you surrender your life to him today? Will you give God total control and say like Isaiah, Lord, here I am. Send me. Send me. All you have to do is admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God who lived for you and died for you and that God raised him from the dead and then see, confess that with your mouth and believe it in your heart and you shall be saved. The ABCs of salvation. If you've, if you've done that, if you've admitted that you're a, a sinner in need of a Savior and, and you want to ask Jesus to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. And then if you believe that he did, because he does live, that God raised him from the dead, and you confess that you are saved. And my brothers and sisters, if you pray that prayer and you confess the Lord Jesus, will you email us or send a comment to let us know that you've trusted Christ and as soon as God, not the governor, says that it's safe for us to uh, cohabitate in this place again. We'll look forward to baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We love you. We thank you. And we praise you. In Jesus' name.
experience. We thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. And we thank you for the privilege to worship you through giving. And our strong God, we ask that you would bless both the gift and the giver, that both will be used for the furtherance and upbuilding of your kingdom, and that no one who gives will suffer lack because of that gift, but we'll all find your word to be true when you promise to meet and supply our every need according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Now, our strong God, we ask that you would continue to bless us and keep us, continue to make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Continue to lift up your countenance upon us and grant us your peace, a peace that the world did not give and therefore the world can't take away, a peace that surpasses all understanding and a peace that will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. Now may trouble neglect us. May our neighbors respect us. May angels continue to protect us. And when you call, may heaven accept us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
God bless you. Have a wonderful week.